Welcome to the Australian Christian Lobby's Voice for Values. This episode contains discussion of themes some may find confronting. Welcome to Voice for Values. I'm Martin Isles. Heteronormativity, uh, a word that is applied to beliefs that you and I used to think were completely normal and didn't even need a word to describe them. The fact that boys are boys, girls are girls, and the boys tend to like girls and girls tend to like boys. Uh, and girls and boys become men and women, and men and women get married, and men and women have families. These sorts of basic ideas about the very fabric of our society are now labelled heteronormativity, and there is an ideology and a belief system out there that is challenging heteronormativity as we speak in Western culture. Last week on Voice for Values, I talked to the Australian Christian Lobby's Director of Research, Dr. Elizabeth Taylor, about this phenomenon, and particularly the philosophical roots of much of the LGBTIQ movement and where their ideas of sex and sexuality have come from and how that they are seeking to challenge the Western world's understanding of heteronormativity. This is happening in the education system. This is happening through the law courts. And last week we saw a Supreme Court case coming out of, out of Canada which clearly said that beliefs about human sexuality as male and female for the purposes of marriage are harmful to LGBTIQ people. Where is this all going to end and how is it being manifested in our own country in Australia? Dr. Taylor joins me once again to talk about this important subject. Welcome to the program, Dr. Taylor. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I've just described there um, uh, this word heteronormativity, which we went into in some detail in the last episode, and we now have an understanding of it again uh, for the present episode. Um, That is really the target that is being designed by those who are trying to radically change the law in Australia around things like marriage, things like sexuality, things like gender. Um, Can I ask, what replaces it? If heteronormativity is no longer a feature of, of our society, where are we going? Hmm. I mean, that's that's uh, at the heart of the issue, so it's an important question. Uh, heteronormativity and LGBT oppression, if you listen to the thought leaders of the LGBT activist uh, movement, they're just different ways of saying the same thing. So LGBT oppression and heteronormativity are the same thing, and we won't get rid of LGBT oppression until we get rid of heteronormativity. So um, Ros Ward uh, is often quoted for her address to the Marxism 2015 conference in Melbourne where she explained this, uh, you know, with a Marxist overlay, but I think the Marxist overlay is implicit in the narrative from this activist movement. And she says that LGBT oppression and heteronormativity are woven into the fabric of capitalism and only Marxism provides both the theory and the practice for genuine human liberation. It offers both the hope and the strategy needed to create a world where human sexuality, gender, and how we relate to our bodies can blossom in extraordinarily new and amazing ways that we can only try to imagine today. So, uh, it's an incredible this, vision of, of utopia, isn't it? Ah, Which comes out of the idea that we have to do away with all the basic beliefs we have about boys being boys, girls being girls, sexualities being heterosexual, this kind of thing. Get rid of that assumption altogether and you've got utopia. That's right. But what's interesting is utopia doesn't even have, we can't describe it. All we can do is, in fact, we can't, we can only try to imagine it. We can it. only we, imagine what utopia might be like. That's right. We haven't got a word for it. So I've, I've given it a word, which is queer normativity, because if you listen to the thought leaders from the, acti- the LGBT activists, um, they actually believe that this is liberation, not just for LGBT people, but liberation for everyone. So, right. in fact, if you read further into uh, how Ros Ward thinks about this, she says that actually uh, the whole institution of the family is a a cunning invention of the capitalist overlords to make us believe, poor, you know, proletariat that we are, that uh, we need to live in families. So she says, uh, the ruling classes may concede reforms, and they have because we fought for them, and they may fund programs, Life Safe Schools Coalition, but they will never transform capitalism to create real economic or social justice. And it's only the working class that shares the interests of all the oppressed groups in society because we can only meet the demands of everybody in taking collective ownership of everything. So this is a a very radical view. But she says that alongside sexism, homophobia and transphobia, um, the 
the, this oppression that the ruling class has wrought on our bodies and relationships and sexual sexuality and sexual identities. Um, they all serve to break the spirits of ordinary people and to consume our thoughts and to make us accept the status quo and for us to keep living or aspiring to live or feel like we should live in small social units and families where we must reproduce and take responsibility for those people in those units. So this is all the confection of uh, capitalism in order to oppress the working classes into reproducing themselves for the benefit of capitalism. So everyone is oppressed by this system, including you and I. We just don't know that we actually do need liberation from the sexual restrictions that are included in the structure of society that have been pressed down upon us. Mm. And we don't know. We're just sheep that have gone along with it. That's the way society is ordered. I mean, has there ever been a society in all of history where queer normativity has been achieved? No, uh, not not to this extent. I mean, what she's saying uh, correlates very closely with what Kinsey was saying, which is that this would be a marvellous thing if we just got rid of all of the taboos and restrictions. And there have been, of course, pockets um, in different civilizations where transgenderism and homosexuality become celebrated by the elites. But, you know, history doesn't give us a lot of comfort on that score because those societies normally deconstruct quite quickly or become, you know, get invaded by barbarians who are normally heterosexual. Uh, therefore, it would seem that the project is a jolly difficult task. Uh, you and I know that uh, it's difficult because uh, heteronormativity just happens to be the way people are naturally inclined because that's the, world, the way the world is created and the way the world is. Uh, but to overthrow those natural structures which are so deeply entrenched in all of society, as we said in the last episode, all the way down to the way we speak, gender pronouns and the storybooks we have on the shelves and the way we live our lives, it must be an enormous task. It's an enormous task. Uh, it's, I don't think it's an impossible one. And this is what I think is very interesting because I would agree with them that all of these things probably can be deconstructed. It's just whether or I would disagree with them fundamentally about whether or not that is a good idea, whether or not human happiness lies on mm. the other side of the rainbow in whether that way. Whether it's utopia. Yeah, whether yeah. that's really going to um, be a recipe for health and happiness. And I think that uh, probably these taboos and constraints, although we might they might think of them as limiting uh, our freedoms. Uh, I, I don't think that this is uh, necessarily fundamentally, that their version of liberation is one that I um, think is uh, conducive to a strong and flourishing society. Well, look, let's come back to the idea then of how this great uh, reform project might be taking place in our culture, particularly around legislation and education, right off the break. Voice for Values at acl.org.au. Welcome back to Voice for Values. I'm Martin Isles. I'm joined today by Dr Elizabeth Taylor, the Director of Research from the Australian Christian Lobby, and we've been having a discussion on today's program about heteronormativity, the word given to all of the things that you and I have always thought are so normal that we haven't had to name them, which is that boys are boys and girls are girls, and boys and girls tend to like each other, and they become men and women, and they get married, uh, and sexuality tends to be heterosexual, except there are some who, who lie on the, the fringe, who are not heterosexual, uh, and so on. These beliefs have been labelled and there is a political agenda at work to undermine all of these traditional understandings of the human person and particularly human sexuality. And we talked about the phrase that Dr. Taylor has coined, uh, queer normativity, the end goal of the activists to bring in a world where all of these traditional ideas are completely removed and that sexuality is liberated, gender is anything we say that it is, and so on and so forth. But we've just come to a point in the conversation where we want to talk about how this great reform project might be achieved in Australia today. Now, the first obvious one is legislation. Uh, what are some examples, Dr. Taylor, of legislation which aid this reform project towards queer normativity? Uh, you, one obvious example is uh, anti-discrimination, the proliferation of anti-discrimination law based on the idea that um, homosexuality or sexual orientation is a fixed property of identity, uh, that gender identity is an ineffable thing separate from biology, so you can be a man in your head even if you have a woman's body, and that this gender identity is more important in terms of who the real person is than, than the body that they um, exist in. And so that, that's now enshrined in the Sex Discrimination Act, which was recently changed to replace a um, man and woman as separate biological categories and has now replaced gen gender identity has now replaced sex as the defining characteristic of whether or not you're a man or a woman. 
So that's one um, big change in legislation. And there's been legal rights granted to people who claim to have those attributes so that they can, in a sense, use the law to fight back uh, against the heteronormative establishment, I suppose. I mean, there's that element as well, where a certain class of people are given extra legal rights, almost in order to correct the balance. Yes, yeah, that's right. So now the law agrees that gender identity is the thing that that, uh, determines whether you're a man or a woman, not your biology. Um, Now, one manifestation of that is where men identify as women and want access to women's toilets and bathrooms and sporting teams, um, or, and and the the other way around. So that's just um, old fashioned transgenderism, but the idea of gender is now changing in a number of ways as well, so that, um, because according to queer theory, you shouldn't necessarily be constrained to binaries. Why why be stuck to a male-female binary? So you might get people say, well, on the spectrum between male and female, I'm kind of in the middle, but just slightly one inch off to the to the right. So um, you, gen- gender can, even the definition of gender is now changing in all so sorts of ways. So it's completely open-ended. It's completely sort of build your own adventure. Absolutely. In fact, it's an essentially individual thing now. And if you look on Tumblr, then you'll see teenagers being um, encouraged to look at, you know, there are 72 established genders that we've found, and they might be things like glass gender, which feels fragile, or celesty gender, which feels bright and celestial. So what's interesting about this is it's no longer anything to do with uh, gender in the old-fashioned sense. It's much Mm. more to do with individual personality and identity, who you are, the quintessential thing that makes you unique and special. And what does the law on marriage, which has recently changed, have to do with the project around queer normativity? Oh, well, that changes the nature of the family altogether because you've broken that essential triangle that Roswald was talking about, um, the the male-female child um, triangle, which was the fundamental group unit of society. Well, now biology does not define the family anymore because you can have two mothers that are exactly the same as two fathers that are exactly the same as one uh, mother and one father. So the, the biological relationship to the child is obviously changed by that, but also the importance of gender is changed. So you no longer have gender diversity. So there is um, this idea that in w- with the introduction of same-sex marriage that uh, two mothers is exactly the same as two fathers, and y- it's not right to distinguish between them, and we don't now linguistically distinguish between them because they're all encompassed under this one word, marriage. It seems to me then that actually, uh, as a first port of call, the change to the marriage law seems to be an excellent thing for those who would like queer normativity, because once you've done away with what marriage teaches us about what gender is for, uh, and particularly the binary nature of it, what sexuality is for, and also that that heteronormative structure of marriage is the founding basis of the family. If you undo those sort of principles in law, then you've got a lot to play with now. Mm. There's there's other lesser issues or other more advanced stages of the debate that you can work through. Um, One of those is, is, is of course, the whole uh, issue of transgenderism, the T in LGBTIQ Mm -hmm. and the liberation of gender, which follows from the liberation of sexuality. Uh, And uh, I know you and I have had a discussion, for example, about the whole idea of conversion therapies uh, for gender dysphoric people. Uh, Can you speak to that and what that means for the reform project from a legislative point of view on uh, queer normativity? Mm. So conversion therapy or the the banning of it depends on uh, a belief system that says that uh, gender or sexual orientation are fixed properties of identity, that you're born that way, that it's hardwired from birth and therefore that it's discriminatory to change those things or to attempt to change those things. But more than that, um, conversion therapy or even the... um, the idea that someone who has unwanted same-sex attraction should be able to seek counselling for that, um, well, well, that's a terrible thing because that uh, affirms the idea that this that heterosexual that heterosexual attraction is superior to homosexual attraction. So what they call that then is internalised homophobia. If someone has unwanted same-sex attraction and uh, they would like to get rid of it, uh, well, their belief system is wrong that it needs to be changed and therefore we're not going to allow people to affirm that wrong belief by allowing conversion therapy because this is changing what we believe to be something about the fixed, uh, settled nature of of individual identity. So essentially if you affirm someone in a homosexual lifestyle then that's affirmations of their sexual identity but if you want to or if you maybe counsel them against it even at their own request or they ask for help uh, get to, to change it, then that's uh, conversion. And the same goes with gender. If somebody feels like a boy uh, and they want to become a girl, then you can make them a girl and that's affirmation. But if you keep them as a boy, it's conversion. And that is now, uh, in some US states, illegal. Yes, extraordinary, isn't it? 
It is. Uh, we've opened a Pandora's box, uh, I've said uh, the last episode, and there's a lot more to be said about this subject. Today we covered the issue of law. Uh, on the next episode, I'd like to turn to the education system and the way in which that is being changed in order to undermine ideas of heteronormativity in favour of queer normativity. Uh, For today, Dr Taylor, thank you for joining us once again. My pleasure. Voice for Values from the Australian Christian Lobby at acl.org.au.